Hello. Hey, right. hey William. Hey there, William. William. Great to see you. Thank you. William, I've been looking for you. Oh, hey. thank you. Thanks, Dick. Yeah, I'm just thinking about you so much because of the loss of your dad. Yeah, thanks. Really? People have been very kind. And uh, yeah. there have been so many really warm greetings and photographs and well wishes and flowers and everything. So it's very nice. Thank you. I think you got my uh, Wall Street Journal tribute to your dad. I did. I did. It was all wonderful. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent, Stu. Good, uh, good bit of writing. Thank oh, you. Thank you for your note too. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, 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 I think Ted was invited. I don't know what his schedule is today, but um, I did invite him, William. Uh, I didn't hear back, but I did make sure and I sent him a reminder. So. Yeah. No, I got your reminder too. Um, yeah, th th an embarrassment of riches in a way. There have been a lot of people sending a lot of really very kind and poignant uh, messages to us. And um, sometimes it's like, I can't, I can't process this right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, I bet. But, but, uh, so that might be part of it, but anyway. William, I gather that he had a chance to talk to President Carter and President Biden before oh yeah boy so he got a call from um president carter and then he got a call from president biden and then president clinton called i believe i missed it but i believe the vice president um harris called and uh so he really he was kind of past the point where he was engaging in anything um he did say uh, you know god bless you to uh, president biden and mrs mrs biden the first lady but mm -hmm. you know he was really tired by then i mean that really sustained him for a while and you know right after mom's funeral in 2014 he he went back down to the mayo he was at the mayo uh when she passed away or pretty close and so he rushed back up to town to be with her in her final hours and then uh after mom's services um he went back to the mayo and when when they uh, opened him up they said uh boy if we if we knew what we'd see when we'd opened him up we would never have let him leave for yeah. these services but you know these the the heart surgeries were they're amazing i mean the, they're not heroic i mean he it sure wasn't his heart that gave out because his heart was moving very clearly. I mean, I, I was in the room and I think, Lou, yeah, Louis was there and um, it was very quiet, very peaceful. He had all of his family around and, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, a loving um, embrace and send off. So it was really just, just so beautiful. And uh, he knew that he was loved and, you know, Clinton said, I love you. And President Carter said, I love you. And Biden, oh, he just went on and on about where dad had been, how dad had been there for him when he was facing loss. Jill, I mean, the first lady uh, reiterated it. It was just really beautiful. And you could tell that uh, he was present for it. And, um, and he really just, I just think he felt very fulfilled and, and, um, and really, really happy about those, um, the last few days. And he was comfortable, but not really out of it. But, you know, our conversations became increasingly uh, one-sided as he was just slowly uh, uh, getting ready. And my, my uh, cousin Tarrant um, Mondale, uh, Mort's daughter, was saying, yeah, he's really in between two worlds. And that lasted for some time, but 
he really, I mean, what a, what a great send off to an, uh, an excellent human being. Um, you could do a lot worse than that. So yeah. it was just uh, very nice. And we had a very small uh, service with Chan and Linda Pedersen and Paul Pedersen and uh, Patty Schwartz, his caregiver. And before that, mom's caregiver. So more or less since 2011, she's been uh, at the house on and off. And then uh, my daughter, Charlotte, and I, Ted, um, Becky, his wife, and twins, Cassie and Danny, and then Louie, Amanda, and Barrett. And there was one singer who sang at, uh, at mom services. She was just amazing. I have the program. I was going to show the program. I think it's in my car right now. But uh, And then Tim Hart Anderson, who officiated uh, at uh, mom services, gave a beautiful, very small, uh, sh uh, short, I should say, um, remembrance and um, some personal observations from Ted and I, and and that that was it. It was just beautiful. Thank you so much. That that was a that was wonderful to hear. Thank you. If you have anything, uh, I, I'm going to be putting together a special memorial newsletter for everybody in the Carter Mondale family, uh, and. If you have anything that you could send to me, Jay Beck at the Carter Center, I'd appreciate it. And also, if anybody on the call has anything they'd like to say or share, please send it to me. My email's on the Carter Mondale newsletter, or you can call the center and get to me. But uh, we just want to basically share everybody's thoughts and feelings. But what you just said was, was really powerful, and I thank you for, for doing that. Will there be a memorial service sometime later in the year? So, well, Lee Sheehy, uh, who you may know from advance, um, is is heading up the Minneapolis services, and then um, and then Mike is uh, heading up the uh, the DC services. I've heard September, but I think that's variable. I think people just want to get together and celebrate it. Um, but our, like I said, our, our service was very small. And um, what I can do is send you a, uh, a, a photo. I wish I knew how to do it right now. Um, the interesting thing that the photo wouldn't show is, um, so dad was cremated at the uh, Minnesota uh, Cremation Society. And um, he, his ashes were put into a Warren McKenzie pot and the funny, the interesting thing about that, I don't know if it's funny, but so mom was cremated and she was placed into the same urn by Warren McKenzie, her teacher and friend in the pottery, who's a legend in the pottery circles. And then uh, I, I guess he scattered her ashes somewhere. He didn't tell anyone, but he did it. It's not so great. <laughs> And, um, and uh, so they, he said, I want to be, uh, I want my ashes to go into the same urn. So, uh, I mean, that was so great. I'm sure mom would be very happy about continued use of that urn. And of course it's a gorgeous uh, piece. And I'll, I guess what I'll send is a photograph of dad's flag, which has been folded and that, his remains in the in the urn at the chapel at the Westminster uh, Presbyterian uh, Res Westminster Church in uh, in Minneapolis. It's just it, I just snapped a photo out of my camera and thought people would like to see it since mm -hmm. everybody was having a lot of feelings about it. But because of COVID and other things, we really limited it. You know more than we wanted to, but it was. Um, it's very brief and very nice. So I'll try and send that right away. And I, I just uh, thank everyone for everything. What a what a life and um, what a way to go. Because he had people calling him and Zoom calls and some personal meeting, uh, some personal gatherings and cakes and flowers and friendship and um, 
he really i think if anyone was wondering about his last uh time on the planet it was full of respect and love and admiration and he was there for it so he like mom went very quickly but he was there for it so it was just a beautiful thing it's you know we all got a one-way ticket so is he having a, a service in new in washington that's what i hear uh uh, the service will be in September. I don't know. I don't know where, but it is so nice to see you. Great. Good to know. Good to know. Thank you very much. So, Jay, uh, Jay I think we have, uh, there are a few people who have joined, but uh, I, we're, we're at about 10 after one. Why don't, why don't you uh, get us started and then we'll, uh, thank you, William, for that uh, accounting. That's terrific. And Anything you want to share, share it with uh, Jay and or me, and we'll make sure it gets to everybody who was on the list. And, 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 and apologies to those who aren't with us. I mean, we did our best to pull together a list of emails and names and whatnot. And I think we sent out about 60 invitations and uh, looks like we got maybe 40 people. So that's pretty good. Uh, Jay, do you want to start us off? You know, well, first, William, thank you again for that was that was very moving, and uh, uh, I thank you for sharing that. Uh, we just wanted to get people together that loved Walter Mondale and have a chance to share stories and and have let all of us just air a little bit what's what we're thinking and what's in our heart. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be putting together a memorial uh, newsletter to share with everybody. And if any of you have anything you want to send to me, please do so. And we will add your thoughts and comments into the newsletter uh, and share that later. We'll also, uh, if by the time that newsletter is out, it, it may be several weeks before that happens, hopefully we'll know a little more about any memorial services that can share that or in any other kind of direction the family has uh, to share with everyone. But we, we Les and I thank you for being here, and Les was going to call on a few people to start off uh, any thoughts or comments that you might have. So, Les, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jay. And I am, we are recording this so that uh, Jay will have uh, something to work with as he puts together the newsletter, but it'll stay within the family until he starts writing, so you know that. Um, and again, thank you all for taking the time to, to share uh, your thoughts and memories of uh, the Vice President. Uh, and uh, they can be poignant, they can be pointed, and they can be humor and, uh, humorous. My guess is there'll be a, a good mix of all. Uh, I asked Dick Moe and Mike if they would uh, sort of start us off from the staff perspective, given their long service uh, with the Vice President. Uh, and uh, Dick, I think I'll, I'll start with you, if that's okay. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Les. And thank you, Jay, for organizing this. I think it means a lot to all of us to be able to talk about Fritz and hear others talk about him. So we're very grateful for that. <clears throat> Let me just say on the subject of memorials, uh, Linda Pedersen, who served Fritz longer and probably better than anybody else, uh, sent me a memo, which Mike has also, indicating that they've opened a special uh, mailbox at the Dorsey firm. It's Mondale Memorial at DorseyAlumni.com. And that they're going to be monitoring, uh, they'll, they'll be monitoring it and, and putting out information as available as to when the memorial services will be. Linda says it'll probably be, probably be in September, but that's not confirmed. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to ask Jay and, 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 and Les to send out this memo from Linda because it has five possible places and institutions for us all to select to give memorial gifts to friends. Yeah. They're all places that, that meant a lot to him in his life, two of them being at the University of Minnesota, the law school and the Humphrey School. McAllister College, Mayo Clinic, 
in the St. Croix River Association. And uh, there'll be information on all of these, these places uh, when they send, send it out to everyone on the list. So let me just reflect for a few minutes. I'll be very brief because I wanna sure, make sure everyone has a chance to speak. Uh, I'm gonna speak just briefly about the vice presidency because briefly because it's been the thing that's been very well written about and extensively written about since uh, since Fritz passed, uh, but 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 it deserves to be mentioned in this context because it's 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 perhaps the most the, the, the single most significant thing that he and President Carter did together, at least institutionally. Uh, the vice presidency, as as I think you know, is a place of total dependency. It, it's an afterthought in the Constitution. Uh, they, 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 they didn't give any real thought to what, it should, what the occupants should do, except preside over the Senate, maybe break ties. Uh, so it's it's lumbered along over 200 years in our history, without direction, without purpose. And it wasn't until Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale came together to really come to grips with this issue that that did it amount to something. And as, and as President Carter said. It became executivized by moving it entirely from the legislative branch into the executive branch, and uh, uh, it it, uh, it was a big risk. It was a big risk, but the thing to know about it is that it didn't require a constitutional change. It didn't require a change in the law. It required President Carter simply to make the decision and to use his powers of delegation to the vice president to make it happen. And they jointly created this. It began in Plains and when, they, when Bondi went down for an interview, just in a very general way. They didn't get any, any, anything specific. But, but uh, Fritz made it clear that he would, he would be very interested in the job if it was substantive, something that, something that uh, Hubert Humphrey had urged him to be, be open to. And, uh, uh, there, there, there was a, a an historian in the news the other day saying that Humphrey had urged Mondale to, uh, to to make a deal with Carter. Well, that's not quite accurate. He, you don't go to a president elect and, and make a deal with him. I mean, but rather, uh, Humphrey said, "Be open. Be open to it, Fritz. Be open to it." <laughs> and and and. and, and and, and once, once, uh, once Fritz heard Humphrey say that, that was when he first became interested in the possibility. So he put put us to work digging up as much information as possible about about Jimmy Carter, whom he barely knew, and, to, and digging up whatever information we could find out about the vice presidency, which is very little because almost nothing existed. There's almost no significant academic or other literature on the office. At least there wasn't there, there wasn't at that time. So anyway, uh, it, it was a big risk when they got together and talked about this at the Blair House about how it was going to work out, and, and, and they, they came to a meeting of the minds. No, no question about that. And Carter had his own thoughts that he added to the memo. And 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 then the first day of their term in office occurred. And, and this is a story that I find enormously poignant and meaningful. One of the things Fritz proposed to the president-elect was that he, Fritz Mondale, fly around the world to the capital cities of all of our allied friends and neighbors and introduce the Carter administration personally. And, and that would also send a very important message that that this vice president mattered. And 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 Carter agreed to that. So the first day in office, we all gathered on the south near the south lawn, and Hubert Humphrey came down for it, and yeah. and watched what watched Fritz get sent off, uh, helicopter last landing on the south lawn, taking off for Andrews Air Force Base. Hubert came back to the office and said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. He said, I was vice president under Leonard Johnson. I had to beg for an airplane. 
And, <laughs> and I, I didn't get a helicopter to, to, to Andrews. I had to drive. And it was usually in the, in the middle of the night. He said, I can't believe this is happening. And, and he was so happy for Fritz. And, and at that moment, we knew this was real. This was really happening. That Carter had full confidence in, in Walter Mondale that this was going to be a meaningful vice presidency, and it was. So, well, we, we, we know about that. I, I just, just a short word about the modern vice presidency. It, it, it's taken too far. Fritz wanted to be an across-the-board advisor without any institutional role. That's changed over time. That, that, and, and President Obama and, and, uh, and Joe Biden changed it because Joe Biden had responsibility for a number of things, including Iraq, implementation of the, the, the stimulus program and so forth. And, and, and he's using his presidency in the same way. Both models are legitimate. There shouldn't be any doubt about that because each president and vice president has to decide on their own what their greatest needs are and what their capabilities are. So, so that has become institutionalized through use. And I think it's, a, it's a virtually a permanent change in the structure of our government. Now, I'd like to switch to the Fritz Mondale that, that went back to Minnesota in 1986 and whence he came originally, because it was a different experience. He was not seen as a failed politician in Minnesota. He was beloved in Minnesota. They knew him, they trusted him, they cared about him, and they supported him. And uh, he, he fit right in. It was, it, was, it was a great thing for him to do. And he spent a lot of time teaching at the Humphrey School and, and doing some other things, mentoring kids and getting involved in different ways. Uh, in, unfortunately, in, on October 25th, 2002, Senator Paul Wellstone and his wife and his daughter and three staff people were killed in a plane accident that was due to pilot error uh, in the Iron Range of Minnesota. A tragic, tragic loss for Minnesota and for, for the families, obviously. The election was just a week away and, and Paul Wellstone's people thought that he was gonna win. But here they were without a candidate a week away. So Jeff Blodgett, who had managed Wellstone's campaigns, mm. gathered a small group, including Paul Wellstone's surviving son, David, and a few others. And they met with Fritz Mondale in his law office uh, the next day, basically the next day, and, and said, Mr. Vice President, we have thought of every possible candidate, potential candidate to run, and because we, we need to keep this seat in Democratic hands, in liberal progressive hands. And we all conclude that you are the only one who can win. A lot of silence, a lot of silence in the room. Fritz paused. He, this is nothing he, he sought to do, nothing he wanted to do. But he looked at them and he said, I will talk to Joan about it. This is what Blodgett wrote recently in an essay in what's called the Minnesota Reformer, which I've never heard about. But this is one of the most moving essays. I've ever seen. Mm. And Fritz did run, but he said he wouldn't start. He wouldn't start campaigning until after the uh, after the memorial service, which was to be held at Williams Arena, the huge basketball stadium at the University of Minnesota. And and of course that turned into a raucous affair uh, with a lot of uh, bad behavior mm. and and a lot of uh, politicization by the Republicans and, and Fox News and so forth. And, and it created a big backlash against against the, against uh, every everything democratic, everything DFL. Nonetheless, Fritz started campaigning, and and it was very hard to get through that morass. And uh, the handwriting was kind of on the wall. And unfortunately, he lost on election night by two percent, two percent. The next morning. He was about to concede, but he went, he gathered, he gathered these Wellstone people together, the young staff, and said, I, before he said anything to the press, he said, I don't want you to get down about this. I don't want you to give up your public service. 
stay involved, make a difference, keep it going because you will make this a better world if you keep at it. And, and then he went before the press and called all these young people up behind him. And then he turned around and faced him. He said, you are the reason I ran. You are the reason I ran. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was very poignant. And uh, he kept being friends. So. He, 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 he uh, so, so he, uh, just, uh, just, just finally, uh, this fellow, Jeff, Bl Jeff Blodgett, was racked with guilt because he had, he had chartered the plane he had, he had for Sheila and for the, for the son and for the staff. And, and, and he thought, well, I'll never, I'll never hear from Fritz Bondale again, and nor should I. He was just, just racked with guilt. Before long, he got a call from Fritz. He said, I want to see you. <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to hear your story your stories about feeling sorry for yourself. I don't want to hear I don't want to hear anything else. I want to hear I want to talk about the future. I want to find out what your plans are and how I can help. And this is what he did. This is what Fritz Mondale did so often in Minnesota. And this is the Fritz Mondale that was known in Minnesota. And and I'm just going to read the very end of, of what Blodgett said. It, speaks so pointy, pointedly. Uh, to who he was and what he was all about. Uh, he said, Walter Mondale became more than just a mentor to me. He taught me about leadership and handling a loss. He taught me about living a full life based on decency, honesty, empathy, and the courage of conviction all things we could use more of in today's pub politics and public life. And they stayed in touch. And Blodge ended up running both of Obama's campaigns in Minnesota and, and winning them. And, uh, when, and, and, and Fritz became revered amongst young people. And Blodge said that when, when he, he had a rally for, for, for Obama before one of the debates, Fritz showed up and was treated as a rock star. A rock star. Imagine this, Walter Mondale, a rock star. <laughs> but, but he was, he was to these kids because he represented the best of what they're looking for. Yeah. Well, well, these stories could go on and on, and I'm and I'm going to leave it there because uh, it's uh, it's so poignant. But but there 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 was a different Fritz Mondale in Minnesota, and, and that that's the one that I choose to honor. He was never a failed politician. He was a good man. He was a very good man. Very good. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Mike, who, who knew Fritz even longer than I did and uh, in many ways better. And who was, who, who was the deputy chief of staff in the white house, as well as the general counsel. And thank God, because, uh, he kept it going. I mean, he was as much a part of this modern vice presidency as anybody. And uh, I'm so grateful to him for his friendship and for what he did. So Mike, over to you. Well, thank you, Dick. Uh, you brought back many memories. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of things on the lighter side. Um, the Mondells were the first couple to live in the vice president's home. Uh, before that, uh, Rockefeller had done a lot to make up, fix up the house, but had never stayed overnight. And uh, so when, once they got settled in, uh, they decided to have a reception uh, for, the, for members of Congress. And so the Mondales, in that day, the, the gates around the vice president's house were much less than they are now. It was one simple gate. And uh, so the Mondials were down at the gate meeting the guests. And one congressman, Jack Brooks, first out of the line, um, came up to the porch where I was standing. I, did, he, I said, hello, he did, paid no attention to me. He went into the house. He came out, stood on the edge of the porch. 
and said, it's okay, boys, he's got the hard stuff. <laughs> that the, President Carter <laughs> never should look at events in the House. Mondale's <laughs> always did, and that, that's how that began. <laughs> well, one of the story I would share, um, we were in, we had been in the um, White House for a period of time. And one day, Mondo called over to my office and said, come on over and see me. So I arrived at his office. He told me to close the door. He then directed me to the wall um, to the left of his desk and said, uh, I want you to pound on this for a series of feet. And I, so I pounded and there was a hollow sound. And Manuel explained that he believed that the bathroom on the other side of the wall had originally been in the office he was now in. And he wanted to know, and he wanted it to change. I looked at him like he had two heads. And uh, he said, you've got to find out. So I had gotten to the vice president's office uh, on January 2nd, because the Rockefellers had been very kind to let me in, and I met a lot of people in the building. So I went to the superintendents who I'd met in the building that ran the place. And um, he pulled out, he, we went through for hours, went through various plans over the years. And the mm -hmm. fact that it was true, and it probably changed during Kissinger's time. Um, so, um, I turned to the, him, got that all done, Mondo was right. Um, so I prepared a memo to the vice president, uh -oh. which I typed personally. I still have the only copy of that memo, which concludes with following. This is the memo, by the way, if you can see it. Um, um, which I typed personally and, and your use of the existing, and this is how the memo and it said, it starts, it says the vice president, his counsel, the case of the missing bathroom. <laughs> and uh, it goes through a variety of things, um, um, how it happened and all that kind of stuff. And then I concluded with the following. Your use of the existing door to this facility requires total walking of 120 feet. 44 such trips will result in you having gone one mile of exercise and consumed a total of 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. The time it takes an average person to walk a mile. Um, and he looked at me and he said, oh shit. And that was the end of that. Um, <laughs> I would like to share with you, um, you know, Peter Hart's a longtime friend of mine. You all know who he is. Um, and when, uh, when Mondale died, uh, he sent me a line, which I, I think is particularly appropriate. He said, the quantity of his life was exceeded by the quality of his public service. And God knows that's the truth. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Stu Eisen said, uh, I, I didn't prep you for this. Would you like to add? Yes. Um, I had a, of course, not as close as Dick uh, or, uh, or Mike, but I had a sort of unique relationship. I don't think there's been a situation before or since in which a vice president and a senior advisor to a president had as close and intimate a relationship as we did he would often call me into his office and uh, put his feet up and have his unlit stogie. And he would talk about his frustrations and also the, the positive sides of the relationship, the fact that he was concerned about a lot of the budget cuts and, and social programs, a whole raft of things. Uh, and it, it created a, a, an enormous bond uh, between us. Uh, that went so far that the one real, I would say, crisis in the relationship um, 
And when Dick mentioned that Carter added to the memo that he did, uh, the, the addition that Carter made, which uh, Bondell did not ask for, was moving him from the old executive office building into the West Wing, uh, just down the hallway, and that that spoke volumes. But uh, the the one crisis came uh, over the president's cancellation when he came back from the Tokyo G7 summit and was supposed to give an energy speech. We had gasoline lines and roaring inflation. The president's polls were, were dropping like a rock and he had this retreat. And there was a very vigorous argument at Camp David about how to deal with this crisis. And I think Monday was very upset that uh, the president in the end accepted Pat Cadell's notion of the crisis of confidence speech, or as it was misnamed, the Malay speech. And then that was compounded by, I think the one thing he did not have prior knowledge of in the four years of the administration, which was the uh, cabinet firing. He read about it when he was campaigning in Tennessee. And that really did cause a, a crisis in the relationship, but it was quickly overcome I think because Kennedy was running, because he realized in the great scope of things how intimate their relationship had been and how much he owed the president and how much uh, they they shared together. In many ways, it was a, the sort of odd couple. I mean, you had a sort of Southern moderate uh, from a right to work state and a Northern liberal uh, who was very close to labor unions. Uh, and yet they were able to uh, meld the best of their philosophies. Uh, and I think that the, the, the bonds were first on civil rights. Uh, they both had a very strong commitment to civil rights. They both had a very strong commitment of Mondale's whole Minnesota and Norwegian background and Carter's uh, morality on ethics and government. Uh, and this supposed odd couple actually got along remarkably well. Uh, one of the things that was hinted at in a memo, but concretized by Carter, is they religiously had one-on-one -on -one, uh, lunches, no notes taken, uh, where Carter and Mondale met in the Oval Office and Mondale felt completely comfortable in, in sharing all of his uh, views I, I'm not sure that any subsequent president has really had that that kind of relationship. Substantively, his contributions uh, beyond creating a model for the office were really manifold. He had a major impact on the Camp David Accords by his mission at a tense time between Carter and Begin. Uh, in the Middle East and then coming to Camp David as well. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of the build up of the education programs, Title I, elementary and secondary education, the Pell Grants, Head Start, and the creation of the Department of Education uh, really bore a lot of his signatures. In addition, uh, one of the things that's, that's not recognized is the degree to which the staffs integrated. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mondale had his own staff. You know, he had uh, Gail as domestic advisor and he had his own foreign policy people and so forth. But Dick had a title that was a dual title. He was chief of staff to the vice president, but he was also assistant to the president. And Gail participated in all of our domestic policy uh, issues. Another thing that, that Fritz did, which was really critical, is we made the mistake, I think, of inexperience of overloading the legislative uh, agenda in the first six months with too many priorities. And the, the president put Fritz in charge of a really critical priorities exercise, which divided issues into sort of three categories. One, those limited numbers that would require presidential attention, 
Second was White House attention and third could be done by the cabinet. And it really did help focus the administration. Uh, just a couple of uh, other stories. And I want to really turn this over to Marty because I think one of the great, great, great things that Fritz did and that's so relevant today is the Indo-Chinese uh, refugee policy and the speech that Marty worked on him, uh, worked with him on, which reminded everybody of the failure of Avian. And I'd love Marty to talk about that because I think in many respects it was Fritz's, Fritz's uh, greatest hour, but yeah. he was a champion on affirmative action, uh, reversing the original draft of the Baki brief. Uh, his imprint was just on so many things, but also in this unique integration of the staffs. And I, I'm not sure, Dick, when you talk about the two models, I'm not sure that the, the future vice presidents had quite the degree of integration of the staffs as, as, we, as we accomplished. So uh, one last thing, just on the humorous side, um, early on when he, he called me in and he again had his feet on the on the desk and had his unlit stogie, he said, now look, uh, I get hundreds and hundreds of phone calls and you will also, and I'll tell you how to handle them. You get your office to call at lunchtime when everybody's going to be out and you can then check them off without having to actually talk to anybody. <laughs> it's great understated, understated humor. But uh, Marty, there's so much more to say on the substantive side, but I really, again, think it's so relevant when we see the refugee situation today and what Trump did, of what you and, and Fritz crafted for that Geneva conference, right after, you know, when the Indo-Chinese, the Vietnamese refugees were escaping North Korea, North Vietnam's takeover and going into these boats that were sinking in the South China Sea. But Marty, really, please uh, discuss that because it's, I think, one of his greatest hours. Thank you, Stu. And, and I just have to say, uh, just looking at all of your faces on the screen, when I think of Fritz and I think of his legacy and what he's meant to, to us, it's you all who are so much of what I am grateful for about him. The fact that we could be uh, alumni and learn from him and see what public service was like. This is a gift. So thank you, uh, Les and Jay, for bringing us together to experience this. It's It's been kind of frustrating looking to September. Uh, and and this, mm -hmm. this is a great steam valve uh, in, in the positive sense for, at, at least for me, to feel uh, collectively what we feel about Fritz and, and his family. Um, uh, Stu mentioned that, uh, the vice president was in Tennessee when uh, we learned that the president had fired the cabinet. Uh, we were on uh, a nationwide tour to promote the SALT II treaty. And uh, we were all around the country. And it was only when uh, that had happened and we learned about it that we also learned that the vice president would be representing the US at the UN uh, Conference on Refugees in Geneva. And so we had uh, just a couple of days to get ready for that trip. And uh, though Fritz had been deeply involved in things like the Sixth Fleet uh, picking up refugees and other substantive issues, the idea of actually at the end of this backbreaking week, all, I mean, thousands and thousands of miles and many, many stops in few days, the idea of then his going to Geneva to convince the nations of the world uh, was a very last minute thing. And I was fortunate uh, to be able to draw on the materials that had been prepared in anticipation of President Carter 
uh, uh, going there. And so David Aaron and Dick Holbrook and, and others who had put together these files uh, were uh, uh, FedExed to us on, on the road. And I got to read them uh, in between Salt Two trips. And then overnight uh, from our last event in Philadelphia to Geneva was when I was uh, doing whatever I could do on my old IBM Selectric 2 so that Fritz could see it in the morning. And when we got there on the tarmac, the US delegation was there to welcome us and Ellie Wiesel was there. And then, so Fritz gave him the draft that I had given him maybe uh, 20 minutes ahead of time. And he said, uh, here, uh, have a look at this and tell me what you think. And Wiesel looked at me and said, history will be watching you, young man. And, and Fritz nodded very enthusiastically. And then uh, I, I learned from Fritz and from everyone else around that the room he would be speaking to would be, as he explained, the biggest bunch of stiffs that he'd ever made a speech to. And these were all people not kindly inclined toward the US or toward the idea of uh, accepting refugees. And luckily I had to draw on the story of Avion, which was uh, uh, the site of a conference some years before uh, in which the nations of the world uh, had to decide what to do with the increasing issue of uh, Jews and their plight in, in the Third Reich. And that set of nations uh, decided not to accept any, even though, as it mm -hmm. turned out, if every nation had accepted 17,000, uh, the Jews of Germany would have been uh, uh, saved. And instead, uh, they all offered excuses. And when Fritz read them, uh, he was glad to repeat them to that room because mm -hmm. every one of those excuses was exactly what was being said about the Indo-Chinese refugees. And so he did that. He did stir the conscience of that room. And at the end, something happened which had apparently never ever happened in that room or at <laughs> such an event, which was mm -hmm. that everyone stood up and gave him a standing ovation, which completely blew our minds and, and his, and I think one another. And uh, the great joy was that uh, in this uh, international disaster, words for a change and the UN sometimes for a change actually mattered and the commitments of the nations of asylum to rescue and admit uh, the boat people and, and people in concentration camps in, in, in the other Southeast Asian countries uh, emerged from that. And I'll, I'll be forever grateful to have had any role in that. Um, just one other thing, um, uh, this is a footnote to what Dick Moe said uh, about uh, the Wellstone campaign. Um, in uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, a few hours after he had met with the Wellstone family and was considering it, Ted Mondale called me and said, he will do this, but only if you come and uh, mm -hmm. go on the bus with him. And I, was then in a very different life a long time uh, since th the vice presidency, as was he, but I said yes. And so he also asked uh, Chuck Campion and Maxine Isaacs, many of you know them, and the three of us uh, got on the bus. And so we, we went all over Minnesota in, in that remaining uh, seven days 
and especially the Iron Range. God knows why, but there we were. Um, and then we, we ended up in the Twin Cities and I will never ever forget, and this goes to what Dick said about how he was welcomed uh, subsequently in Minnesota. I will never forget the very last camp event of the Mondale uh, senatorial campaign in 2002. The event was in a parking lot and it was packed. It was about one in the morning and it was completely packed shoulder to shoulder with uh, supporters of Fritz, obviously of, of Paul Wellstone and the DFL as well. And I saw for the first time in my life ever, but certainly in the case of Fritz, what they used to call uh, about the, the people at Bobby Kennedy's events or on the streets watching his motorcade, jumpers, people who jumped up and down with pleasure and joy at seeing Fritz. And this happened throughout his final uh, rally Cry, rallying cry, which was largely ad-libbed, and they just loved it and wouldn't let him go. It was truly amazing. In all the years that I had been with him at events, I'd never seen anything like that, and I was so grateful for it. And then the, the bus took us, finally, after seven days, back to his house, and, and it parked in the front, and he just sat there. He did not want to get off the bus. And we all just sat there quietly bathing in the experience wow. we, we had just had. And then finally, he, he said goodnight to us. He said thank you to the bus driver. And he got off. Well, that bus driver we knew, though Fritz, Fritz didn't know, was going to not going to vote for Fritz. Um, he, he wasn't uh, vetted as a partisan bus driver. And after Fritz left, the bus driver had been at this event and been with Fritz the whole week. Uh, uh, we, we kept sitting there and the bus driver said, I think I'm going to vote for him. <laughs> it was just one of the greatest moments I have had the, the, the privilege uh, to experience. Great, great story, Marty. Yeah. Marty, they're still talking about you on the iron, on the iron ring. <laughs> <laughs> Let, Les, I wonder if I could suggest, of all the people who are uh, alumni, the one that has gone the furthest and done the most is Secretary Madeleine Albright, and she's here. I wonder if you could call on her. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for... Uh, saying I'd gone the furthest. I don't know about that, but I, I was just thinking about uh, the ways that I got to know uh, Fritz and many of you. Uh, and it goes way, way back. Uh, some of you may not think of me this way, but my original political life was as a fundraiser. Uh, and I had been working for Ed Muskie as a fundraiser and I was at the 72 convention with him and I have to admit, uh, I didn't like McGovern. And because I knew Dick Moe, and because I knew that Mondale was uh, in 72 running uh, for Senate again, and uh, I had all those little cards about how I had noted who was gonna give money where, and I took my cards and I was in Minneapolis in November, 1972, the only happy place for Democrats. Um, and it was a wonderful way to get to know Mike and Dick Better and Jim Johnson. And it really was an amazing time uh, to get to know him. So that was one time. The other time was, as I go through my various lives, in 1978, uh, I went to work at the White House doing congressional relations for the NSC. David Aaron will um, agree with me that it was not necessarily um, an easy task to persuade Brzezinski that Congress really existed. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and some of you, frankly, that he should have a congressional relations person. But what was interesting, because it was fun, I was in uh, Spig's office 
when Fritz walked in and he said, we are thinking of offering uh, Madeline the job of doing congressional relations for the NSC. And Fritz said, you couldn't do better. And that was really a great validation, I have to say. And then the wonderful part was that um, I think uh, as uh, has just been explained, he really uh, had made a determination about which were the kinds of things you know, on the Hill that needed presidential attention and White House attention and whatever. And um, I, I say this with some humility in terms of all the, the uh, Carter people that are on the phone call with us, but there really was a sense that Fritz had a sense about the Hill that was unique and it was terrific to be able to, to work with him and think about all the things that had to be done. The next time was totally different. In 1984, when he was running president, I was his representative on the platform committee um, and dealing with foreign policy. And Jerry Ferraro was actually the person that was on the platform committee. Uh, and so uh, we did pretty well on the platform. And then the question was, uh, what was going to happen on the vice presidential nomination. And I have to say that one of the most amazing things was to be in San Francisco when Fritz decided, uh, and he'd done it before, to, nominate, to get Geraldine Ferraro to be the first woman vice presidential candidate. And it was really fantastic. And uh, then what happened was they asked me to travel with her uh, which I did. I sometimes would get phone calls like, she shouldn't have said that about Italian men um, or <laughs> some of the few, uh, but it was really an incredible time and historic if you all think about it. And what a difference it really did make to uh, have her as the nominee and to really make that kind of history uh, with Mondale. And then the last uh, part that we did together um, is uh, there was a new organization created in 1984 called the National Democratic Institute. Um, and it was uh, interesting how it came to life. Um, but what happened was that we really needed to have a chairman that reflected democracy and America. And when Fritz became the chairman of the National Democratic Institute, it was incredible. I was on the board at that time. He made all the difference. And I do think, as some of you've talked about his travels around the world and his capability of discussing a variety of issues of what American democracy was all about, there was nobody better, none. And so it was an honor to work with him on that. I did come out to Minneapolis a few times when he was out of office and I spoke at McAllister and I spoke at the Humphrey Institute and the University of Minnesota. And he really was somebody that was the most amazing human being uh, in terms of working with him. I have to tell this, I look at William and he went to school with my daughters. His name was actually Wiggy. Uh, and, but I also got to know Joan. I played tennis with Joan. Uh, and we got to be very, very good friends. And I now can't remember why she asked me this question. This is a little risque. She said, I need to know how many inches it is from Fritz's crotch to his ankles because we're shortening his pants. Uh, <laughs> but I, I really think it's the most amazing family with the most amazing history and the kinds of things that uh, he was able to do made all the difference. And, being at his birthday, 90th birthday party with many, many of you was a wonderful way to remember everything. And I did speak to him on his last birthday. Uh, and I am honored to have been somebody that knew him uh, and that had the opportunity to have a number of different times that we interacted. And I'm honored really, and of all the friendships as I look at us all in our little boxes here and the various relationships that were created as a result of our connection to Fritz Mondale. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marla. Well, I just add one other so anecdote that uh, I think had actually a historic impact. I remember this. 
uh, and that is the Panama Canal uh, vote, yeah. which was unbelievably difficult. Uh, Rosalind begged the president not to take it on in his first term. He said, well, suppose I don't have a second term. But getting a two thirds majority was very difficult. And one of the most difficult was from Senator Hayakawa, uh, the conservative Republican from California who had said publicly, it's our canal, we stole it fair and square. And because of Fritz's intimate knowledge of the Senate and senators, and because he had a, a vice presidential office in the Senate, he told President Carter that he thought he could figure out a way of getting Hayakawa's vote, which was to appeal to his vanity, which is even greater than that of the average senator, and that say to Hayakawa, if, because he was going to prime Hayakawa to ask, that uh, Hayakawa would meet one-on-one -on -one with Carter every two weeks to share his wisdom. So Fritz puts him on uh, from his Senate office to the Oval Office. And the Senator says, now, Mr. President, you know I'm very strongly against this, this canal. Uh, but he said, if I can share my wisdom with you every two weeks, uh, I might reconsider. And Carter said, Senator, I wouldn't want to limit you just to every two weeks. We might want to meet much more frequently. Voted for it, and Carter never saw him again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, I, yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank uh, and say hello to everybody that I know. Madeline, Mike, Richard, Brian, Marty, Willem. I remember you. We, you stayed with us when we were in San Francisco, uh, and um, uh, Bob Beckel. And uh, the the story I'd like to tell is when we first uh, came in, and uh, uh, Richard Moe talked about Mondale going off, wanting to go off and visit all of our allies as soon as he became uh, vice president, and we did. And uh, so we went all over Europe, and uh, when we got to um, to Italy. Uh, we had a state dinner uh, by the president of Italy, and we went to his home, which was the Curinelli Palace. Curinelli Palace is in Rome, and it was, uh, mm -hmm. until the Risorgimento in Italy, it was the home of the Pope. And when we got there, uh, there was like 20 steps, and we had to climb these steps up to the front door, and there was on every other step on each side, there was some kind of somebody in, you know, um, anyway, stay, way <laughs> standing there, right? You know, and then we went in, into, the, uh, into the entrance and uh, it was this magnificent entry hall. And then we turned right and they opened doors and there was this magnificent uh, uh, place with uh, uh, all kinds of statues and paintings and oh, just fantastic stuff. And then they opened another door and there was another room like that. Again, full of paintings and statues and all kinds of things, uh, in, in latrines, uh, you know. And, and then they opened another door and we, we, did, we went this through about five doors. And then they turned left and we went through another eight doors, little statues and paintings <laughs> and all this stuff. And we finally got to the place where we were having dinner. And behind us, there were every chair, there was a man in livery, like the guys on the, on the uh, steps. And we ate off of silver and gold livery, I mean, uh, plates and so forth. And afterwards, we went to a small room where we talked, he talked briefly to the uh, president of uh, Italy. Uh, and then as we left, we went through another 15 rooms or so, full of paintings and statues and all chandeliers. It was just unbelievable. And then we went down and got in the car and we drove to the hotel where we were staying. And we, as we were drawing up to the hotel, he said, wasn't that really something? And I said, well, uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. He said, can you imagine how they fucked the people? 
<laughs> anyway, Mike, Richard, everybody, nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit in uh, further history. Uh, Greg Snyder's uh, talk a little about the transition, and uh, Dale Liveback talked about 76 campaign events. Uh, others may have stories too, but I know the two of them do. And maybe Gail Harrison too, but uh, Greg, I want to call on you because yeah. you, you were there during the transition. I was. Um, it's great to be with you all. Um, and I. it's humbling because all of you, most of you, you know, had a much uh, longer and more intimate uh, relationship with Fritz Mundell than, than I did. But I, but I do have one story that um, captured for me, at, at least, a couple of the most endearing qualities of, of Fritz Mondale, including his humor, um, mischievous humor, and his incredible decency. And that is, um, during the transition, um, the Washington Post decided that they were going to assign certain writers to interview and do profiles on some of the people who had been prominent in the campaign. They, they did Hamilton, they did Jody. Uh, and I drew the short straw apparently because I got Sally Quinn to do a <laughs> profile. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was, I was, you know, six or eight months out of the bar business in Washington, you know, so not a lot of uh, high level media experience and sophistication. So, you know, Sally and I go out to dinner, long dinner, a lot of wine. And uh, I think, you know, we're just kind of reminiscing about things, her life and mine. She grew up a Catholic. I did too. We went through Catholic schools. And it so happened at that time, I had become, for a lot of strange reasons, uh, Jimmy Carter's Catholic advisor. <laughs> strange reasons being, he didn't know a lot of Catholics. Um, <laughs> and, and when he was, we were up in Pennsylvania and, you know, running, you know, in, in some Catholic uh, areas up there and a lot of discussion of abortion and so on. Uh, he started getting peppered with questions about, you know, well, who is your Catholic advisor? You got all these Georgians and they're Baptists. And, you know, so who do you listen to on Catholic issues? And uh, he couldn't come up with anybody very readily. And he knew that I had three sisters who were nuns, a Catholic nun. And so he quickly, you know, picked up on that and said, well, well great, it's my Catholic advisor. <laughs> I hadn't been in the Catholic church in a long time, but that didn't, that wasn't a problem. So I'm talking to Sally and she's talking about, you know, all the trials and tribulations of, of going through a Catholic grade school and high school education. And uh, I commiserated with her about that. And I, I, I said some, you know, some dumb things in the process of that. And uh, all of that found its way into her profile piece. So meanwhile, we're all down in planes. We don't actually, as hard as it is to believe, we didn't get the Washington Post down <laughs> Couldn't get it electronically at that time, and we didn't even get it physically until many days after it had come out. And so I, I'm, you know, down there just waiting anxiously for how bad this is going to be when it finally appears. And one Saturday morning, at Carter's house <clears throat> in his kitchen. Carter is off somewhere else in the house, and Vice President-elect Mondale shows up <laughs> and with this big shitty name grin on his face <laughs> and he says 
wait till you see the Washington Post today. <laughs> and he's pulled <laughs> out of this briefcase and he starts to read from my interview. And I won't bore you with all of it. It was a very long and dramatic reading, you know, with a lot of laughter in, in punctuating it. You know, but he gets to the high point, which is, you know, and so then, Greg, you, you say to Sally, I think the Catholic Church has done more to screw up people's lives than any other institution in history. <laughs> Carter, the Catholic advisor. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm screwed. This is over. It's been nice. At which point, Carter comes walking into the room. And this is the decency part, which is that Mondale quickly folds up the Washington Post and shoves it into his briefcase. And, you know, we go on. So a week goes by and nobody else brings us up. And Carter is unaware of it, you know, and I'm thinking, I can't believe I dodged this bullet, but thank God for Fritz Mondale having the decency to put that thing away, you know, and then Carter has Ted Sorensen come down to interview for DCI. And he goes through like a long, you know. <coughs> CIA. Huh? Yeah. CIA. What is CIA, it? yeah. CIA, yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm in the room for the interview, just sort of sitting off in a, in a corner. And uh, we get all done. And Sorensen is getting up and ready to go back to the airport and take off. And he turns to Carter and says, well, I'm sure glad you didn't fire Greg over that Sally Quinn thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Sally Quinn thing? Greg, I don't know about that. <laughs> It's just a little piece that she put in the post. He said, I'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I almost dodged the bullet, uh, not not entirely, but uh, I was forever grateful to Mondo for uh, both entertaining us with the dramatic reading of the Sally Quinn piece, but also trying his best to uh, save my skin. <laughs> Great. Uh, Ryan Atwood, do you, do, do I see you? Well, yeah, thank you. I, I've enjoyed these stories and I'll be very brief. Um, I obviously worked um, a lot with Madeline back in the day when we were working on the Hill and uh, used to go to his office and have various meetings. His his knowledge of the Senate and his love of the Senate, I think, uh, I think Dick mentioned that he had been executivized, but the fact of the matter is that that made him even more effective in working with senators uh, because they knew him and loved him. And, um, and then of course worked with him when he was NDI chair and Madeline is absolutely right there. He was just gave tremendous credibility just as she does today to that organization. But the story I wanted to tell was I'm working with Secretary of State uh, uh, nominated uh, Warren Christopher and Peter Tarnoff, his friend, and we're getting lobbied by a certain individual that wanted to be ambassador to Japan. And a few days earlier, Fritz had been offered Moscow and it came out in the paper that day that he'd made change his mind that he didn't really want to go to Moscow. Well, he thought that was going to be the end of anyone asking him to do something. I went down the hall, called him um, and after the relationship we developed uh, with NDI, said, how'd you like to go to Japan, Fritz? <laughs> he said, let me, let me check, uh, let me get back to you. And he got back to me in a few hours and uh, we know that uh, Joan really wanted to go to Japan and, and, and so did he. And, and that happened, um, and I was very, very pleased that uh, there was no way he was not going to be accepted. And uh, for him as, as a presidential candidate, as a vice president, for him to just accept more public service as an ambassador, and he, 
he was an immediate success. I mean, there were a lot of trade issues. There were issues with Okinawa and military people in the southern part of Japan. And, and uh, he was as much on the television in Japan as any, any American ambassador ever had been, perhaps even more so than Mike Mansfield. But he would, uh, I also I just happened to have written a piece about two weeks ago about uh, Taiwan and China. And mentioned in that piece, as David Aaron knows well, he was probably with him, uh, that he negotiated the final steps of dipl diplomatic relations with the People's Republic. And, and it was interesting that a vice president, as perhaps be, as opposed to a secretary of state at the time, in that position of negotiating such a sensitive and delicate matter. Um, so I just loved the man and uh, got to know him so well. He, he convinced me to come out to Minnesota to, to be the dean of the Humphrey School. And we had lunch every couple of weeks and uh, he just became a very close friend. And I really thanked Ted and William uh, for arranging for me to talk to him uh, at the end as well. And it was very emotional for me. I'll just end by saying what he would always say when I'm sure from too many of you, when he wanted to get off the phone, he said, keep up the good work. <laughs> that was the way he ended his telephone conversations. That <laughs> well, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. Others, uh, anybody? Uh, I know. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear from Gail. Gail? Yeah, Gail. Last, <laughs> last I'd like to introduce Gail. You know, um, thanks very much. Hi. Started working for then Senator Mondale at age 22. Mike Berman hired me to be the keeper of his Senate record. And I'd like to talk about that on a serious note a little bit. Uh, racism is a jarring word and it's still a terrible reality. And I think fighting against racism was at the heart of what he tried to do in the Senate. When I first walked through the door, his office was bursting with proposals uh, to combat the misery inflicted um, in the BIA boarding schools and to expose the truly despicable conditions that migrant workers were forced to endure. He fought to enact fair housing legislation. And think about this, he succeeded when he was 40 years old in getting the president to sign the bill he authored in the Senate into law. He fought uh, uh, valiantly to try to make the promise of board Brown versus Board of Education a reality and to break the chokehold on civil rights laws that were imposed by segregations in the uh, segregationists in the Senate by a filibuster reform. The last time I was with him in the Senate, uh, just a few years back, he, uh, he went to testify again on the need for filibuster reform. And the Republican chair of that committee excoriated his proposal. And after that, we went to meet with the two Minnesota senators and uh, Senator Franken asked him what does, and he named that Republican committee chair, think of this bill. And he looked at me and I looked at him and it was which one of us is going to lie about this. And I said, <laughs> I think he's open to it. <laughs> um, uh, President Biden's State of the Union message last week in a follow-up column by Michael Gerson, I think is, is good evidence of the farsightedness um, he had 50 years ago in pushing for 
um, universal pre-K and trying to make childcare affordable for every working family. In 72, Nixon called this agenda socialism and Gerson last week called these proposals part of a credible ideology cont contrasting them with uh, the Republican Party's initiatives he called a dangerous mess. And I just say, I, we've lost uh, to me a hero, uh, a wonderful friend and a very far-sighted leader, but I, I am happy to see that his ideas are bearing fruit now and I, I, I hope they will continue to do so. I thank you all. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, Dale Lyback, you uh, you shared with me a story a couple of us have heard before you from the campaign trail. Why don't you uh, it's a little different tone, but uh, uh, it goes to his warmth, humor, and political instincts, and some of you were. Uh, probably actually with him in McKeesport when there was a little bit of a glitch. Um, and there was a, I believe it was a factory um, that he was going to greet arriving workers um, at some time in the darkness of the morning. And uh, Gail Sullivan would tell this story where he was with us, but uh, Gail was in charge of McKeesport and I was with uh, Jim Kennan in Newark. Um, and I paid particular attention to this because we got a call that uh, the plane would be arriving an hour and a half early, figure out something to do with him. Uh, but there were no workers there. And the press, as it was described to me, climbed off the bus and surrounded his car. And as probably all of you know, vice presidents don't routinely make the evening news other than perhaps Sarah Palin. Um, but here it was a campaign screw up. Um, and Mondale got out of his car and addressed the media. And I'm told his remarks were along the lines, you're probably wondering why I gathered you all here in the middle of the night at a closed factory. <laughs> and he said, I wanted to be able to speak to the media unfettered by potential voters <laughs> and <laughs> and i believe that may have been one of the few uh moments <laughs> on the vice presidential end of the campaign where he made the network news um i think all three of them at the time but um it was hysterical um and as we've all worked for a lot of uh campaigns and candidates and uh people in government who can be very expressive with staff but i thought that said a lot about who walter mondale was indeed indeed uh I, I don't see everybody. Uh, anybody else uh, wish to... Jim Dyke. Can we hear from Jim, Jim Dyke? Dyke? Yeah. Jim Dyke. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been listening uh, intently to a lot of things, and it's so great to see so many other faces. I'll try to be brief because I know we've been on a long time, and I was thinking of some of Gail's comments and uh, yeah. having had the opportunity to work with the vice president on some of those issues. Uh, Stu referenced the uh, Baki uh, brief that we were involved in 
number of other civil rights things. Uh, about two and a half years ago, I had an opportunity. My wife was attending a conference in Minneapolis. She's a National Uniform Law Commissioner. And I said, well, I think maybe I'll just tag along with you because maybe I could stop by and say hello to the vice president while I was there. And so I just called his office thinking, you know, take a shot. And uh, he said, please come by, I'd love to see you. And so Ellen and I went by and what I thought would be a few minutes of saying hello turned into over an hour of discussion. And he shared with me something that I had, he had never shared with me before. And that is that how much it meant to him uh, to have me work with him. As you know, I traveled with him through the 76 campaign, the 80 campaign, and also 84 when he was a nominee. And he had said how, how important it was to him to have people see that someone who looked like me was working with him closely, very much a part of his whole effort and showing his commitment to do the right thing. And it was, it was quite moving. It was something I had not expected because as you know, he, at least, and I was not aware of him sharing a lot of his personal views like that uh, to staff, but it meant an awful lot to me. And my wife to, the, to this day continues to talk about that and how impressed she was with his sincerity in saying how important it was for him to send a message and send a signal uh, about some of the things that he believed in. And, and that meant an awful lot to me. And learning from him, uh, I've tried to learn, use the things that he taught me uh, that I learned during having the chance of working with him is I've tried to move on. For example, we talked about education. I had the opportunity to go on and be secretary of education in Virginia. And a lot of the things that I learned uh, from the vice president uh, I tried to carry out at the state level because of the commitment that he had shown. And so I am forever grateful to him for giving me the opportunity uh, to be exposed to uh, what happened at the national level and have an impact. And uh, it, it means a lot, especially in this day and age when Minneapolis has been in the news for a lot, number of other things that are not consistent with what I've just talked about. Uh, it means an awful lot to me to be able to call back and recall how he stood with me and taught me how to look for the best in people and to try to make a difference. Uh, he also, by the way, was, uh, people mentioned his great sense of humor. I'm sorry that the American people didn't get a chance to see all of it uh, because uh, it, it, it was it was tremendous. And one example I will give you is in 1976, when we were traveling on the campaign plane, and I see Stu, I think Stu is still on here. Uh, I would get briefings from Atlanta about what was going on so that I could help keep uh, uh, then Senator Mondale briefed on what to expect at our next stop. And I remember getting a fax saying that uh, Playboy was about to release a uh, interview with President Carter or, or then Governor Carter uh, that might be a little uh, awkward to have to speak to. And I remember telling the Vice President, uh, uh, this is what President Carter has said, and when we land, you're going to have to talk to the press and give a response to all that. And I remember he looked at me and says, well, do you think maybe we could just fly around up here until election day and then land this plane? <laughs> 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 uh, we're perceptive. It was, if there was any way we could have done it, we would have, but uh, we had to face the music. And the last thing, and because I know others want to say something, those of you in the district area, in the DC area, have been hearing a lot about the fact that there's a push now and the House just passed legislation trying to get the District of Columbia full voting representation in the Congress which is a huge deal down here. And people are very much committed to that. I keep reminding people back in 1978 under the Carter administration led by Vice President Mondale because I was there with him on the Hill working with civil rights groups and others, the Congress passed a constitutional amendment to give full voting representation to the District of Columbia. 
It was subsequently ratified by 16 states, but obviously when Reagan was elected and he didn't want to pursue the ratification process, it died. But people need to recognize that Fritz Mondale, just as Gail mentioned, he was well ahead of himself on a lot of the issues that people are now talking about. He was well out in front on that issue as well. And I would hope that those folks who are leading the charge today would, would notice that and give him some credit for what he did back in those days. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share those thoughts. Thank okay. you. Can I just mention one story with when I was working with Mondale in the Senate and he was trying to cut back the, um, um, try to get the, the he was trying to cut the, uh, the, from 66 to 60 votes. And he was working very hard to try to cut that back. It's now 60 votes. And while he was battling for this, he, um, he got a phone call and I happened to walk into his office and he was talking to somebody on the phone and he said, yes, I understand. Oh, well, yes, I, I get it. Well, I understand. Well, yes, 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 it's okay. Well, I understand. Okay, fine. He hung up and he said, could you ever trust a liberal? And the man he was talking to was Ted Kennedy, <laughs> who didn't vote for him in that case. <laughs> Uh, anybody else uh, wish to weigh in? I was I uh, was talking about uh, humor and whatnot. I, I I wrote a piece for Real Clear Politics where I cited an anecdote. This was in '83, and uh, traveling with it was just the two of us, and and we'd done a multi-stop trip. It started in Iowa City and Detroit and Los Angeles and Seattle, then in San Francisco, and. Uh, we're walking back to our hotel to get the car to go to the airport, and I go, oh, shit. He said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I always try to get Sherry a gift when I'm traveling, and I haven't bought anything. And he says, shower caps. So I, <laughs> I, always, I always bring shower caps back to Joan. She loves them. <laughs> hey, hey, hey look. I, I, that is true. <laughs> That is, I can confirm that. <laughs> it's great to be on a call with so many, many people that I had a chance to admit to meet and all of whom I admired in one of really the great pieces of my life in trying to reelect uh, Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale. And so this revolves around the great privilege of meeting at Andrews, getting on an airplane, uh, bringing uh, a number of California legislators and one county supervisor uh, that some of you may remember, Kenny Hahn. Oh, yeah. And the dinner and, and uh, the vice president, as most of you know, uh, like to get a little rest prior to the dinner. And we had passed Palm Springs some minutes ago, and he became aware that uh, uh, that we aren't on approach to LAX. He calls the cabin, and apparently the captain that someone told him to detour uh, to the southern part of Los Angeles County. Now, about that time, Mondale is quizzically asking who the hell in this cabin asked for a redirection. We're running late. About that time, Kenny Hahn grabs him in a headlock and kind of drags him over to the window, starts pointing animatedly out the window saying, do you see that, Mr. Vice President? He said, that's my district down there. And he said, we just had this devastating fire. The people have all kinds of problems in terms of dislocation on and on and on. Finally, Fritz looked at him and he said, Kenny, if you let me out of this headlock and let us land, I'll give you anything you need. <laughs> and that was that. The second quick story is when we were flying over Palm Springs, I mentioned that my mother and father had just moved there. And he said, well, let's get them on the phone. 
and we call my mother and father and he took the phone away from me before I was to make the introduction. And he said, Walter, Melissa, this is the vice president of the United States. And I'm flying over you, your home with your son. Well, I will tell you, you talk about two parents who in their own mind, everything that they had ever worked for had been realized, it was that moment. And the picture that I treasure the most is a picture taken at the Biltmore Hotel before another fundraiser, where the vice president is sitting casually on a credenza, looking at me as though I'm giving him some discreet, influential advice. And you know how inscriptions go. Well, this is why I love it. It says, Mike, my buddy, Fritz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Talking about uh, Mondale and uh, pop culture reminds me of the story that I, I heard. I wasn't there when, when Becky McGowan, when this was in the, Fritz's office was at Winston and Strawn and she heard on the news that uh, Natalie Wood had died. And uh, so she happened to go into the vice president's office and said, gee, I just heard on the news that Natalie Wood had died. He said, oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. That's right. Who's Natalie Wood? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask you the same question. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you two quick stories about the Georgia and Alabama primaries, about how how good he was on his feet and how fast he thought. We were in Alabama and we were down in the state capitol. I was taking him around to introduce him to all the people. And I was taking him to the Speaker of the House in Alabama uh, was a guy we wanted to kind of get on our side. And I was walking him into his office, telling him about the guy. And I saved the best right before I opened the door and sent him in to meet this guy. I said, do you know what this guy did right before he got into politics? He said, no, what? I said, he was a professional wrestler. And I pushed him through the door and closed the door. <laughs> About five minutes later, they came out arm in arm laughing, and the guy became our campaign chair in the state. I mean, he turned that around just like that. Another story happened in Georgia, South Georgia. Uh, somebody was setting up a fundraiser, and I happened to come come down and I joined the entourage to come to that. And we, we were pulling into the front yard and un, unbeknownst to anybody, the people who had their house there decided to have a welcoming committee. And they had three or four young men and three or four young women. The young men were dressed in Confederate uniforms and the women <laughs> were in hoop skirts and beef on, you know, big old hairdos. And they had them scattered around the front porch there's columns and everything, this antebellum house. As the cars drive up, Becky McGowan is about to have a heart attack. And everybody, and we had the press with us and everything. Nothing, you were there, we're in the drive, we're in the chute. Mondale gets out, and in the backyard, they had all the people in this barbecue. And Andy Young was there, he was going to say grace because he had to pray over the food, you know. And so Mondale gets out and starts walking up the driveway, and they had this, 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 this gang of people up there from Gone with the Wind on the front porch. He walks up in waves and just swerves right around the house. <laughs> hey, Andy! <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody just swerved with him, and those people just stood there on the porch. They disappeared <laughs> pretty quick right after that. But he was so fast. He just he could sense the situation, knew how to handle it, and knew how to make things work. Talking about a mischievous sense of humor, uh, I'm sure all of you, or most of you, remember the call sheets. We would prepare call sheets for the president, the vice president, and Mrs. Carter. And it, it, you'd list the person to be called, some information about them, and uh, why, why we're trying to elicit their support or keep it. And then there was a space to answer. And uh, we at the campaign would collect those call sheets, and it was great material to work with. So I submitted one to, uh, well, I submitted call sheets to all three, including the vice president. And just for the hell of it, at the end of the call sheet, there were about 15 calls. The 16th call was Tim Kraft and contact information. 
in the background was he's an extraordinary young man, works well with people, would be a great political asset to our campaign, blah, blah. So I get the call sheets back about two days later and Mondale had filled it all out, cogent comments about every person he called and got to my name. And his comment was, caught him at home at noon, he was drunk. Uh, <laughs> said, he, said he didn't particularly like Carter's do-gooder sense of humor. But, uh, <laughs> Mike worked for us with the uh, enough compensation. <laughs> uh, hey, is Mike Berman on around? Yes. Hi, Mike. Hey, Mike. Did, did you know that, did Mondale ever uh, really not smoke in public? I don't recall him smoking in public. <laughs> but he did smoke cigars. Well, that's what I mean. But he smoked cigars in public. No, he would never smoke no. cigars in public. No. That's no. what I thought. He would yeah. never ever smoke cigars in public. But I always knew when he was awake in the vice president's house because I could smell the cigar, and that really came in handy a number of times. <laughs> 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 Prince Mondale could charm the snakes. He was the best. He was the best of anybody. Uh, second only to Jimmy Carter. Uh, they were a magnificent team together. And Gil Harrison, Sue Eisenstadt, and others could uh, embellish on this story better than I. He was a very, very good lobbyist with the Senate, and he could talk the language. He didn't have to draw pictures for anybody. He was very good. He was the best. Remember how well Danny did with uh, with DeConcini on that DeConcini amendment for the Panama Canal? I never thought we'd get DeConcini, but Fritz figured out a way to do it. And Henry Bellman from wherever he was from. Please, Bob, tell them about tell them about Dickensini. About who? Bob Beckel tell the folks about the Dickensini, how he got the Dickensini vote. Uh, well, a little bit of it was under him, by it, not by him, but by me, but really. But uh, Dickensini was insisting he had to have this amendment. We wanted to tone down, and uh, so I went to see Dickensini at night. Uh, with with Warren Christopher and he was not going to be moved. So Christopher left and I said, Senator, uh, how's it going on in your state? He said, well, Bob, we got all this aluminum. Copper. So, it's copper. Copper, Bob, that's right. Copper, copper, that's right. Copper. And I said, well, wait, you can't sell it? He said, oh, the market's flooded. I want to sell it to the military. So I had worked out a deal with my secretary that when I called her, <clears throat> She would say, uh, she would just stay silent and let me do the talk. So I called her and I said, I'll tell you what, Senator, I'm going to call the defense department right now, see if we can get this deal worked out. And I called my office, talked to my secretary, and he can see you overheard me. I said, you know, you really ought to look at this again, again. all this copper, you, you, you could store it. And then I rolled the dice. I said, oh, I said, thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's nice of you. I said, Deacon Skinny, uh, Senator, you want to talk to the secretary? He said, oh, no, 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 no. I'll be fine. And uh, <laughs> we ordered a bunch of copper, which we <laughs> neglected to pick up. But in any of it. Can I tell a story about what it was like to be on the other side of being lobbied by the White House during the Panama Canal? Because I was working for Ed Muskie, who was chairman of the uh, budget committee and he had to pay for giving away the Panama Canal. And so Beckel would come and he would say, we need to do this and this. And I, every other day there'd be some new news. And I finally said, excuse me, but you know, you keep coming up with these skeletons. And all of a sudden Beckel says, oh my God, skeletons. There's that whole cemetery down there. We have to move everybody. Uh, out of that cemetery. And it was crazy trying to figure out when you were on the Senate side, 
of trying to figure out how to give away the Panama Canal. And then it was really fun to be in the White House on the other side when uh, it passed with all the Deacon Seedy stuff. So great stories about the Panama Canal. <laughs> and a lot of those stories cannot be told. Well, I'll tell you what about the, about the Panama Canal Treaty, and that is I tried to talk the president and the vice president and Vig not to go for the Panama Canal Treaty at the very beginning. And no, you did. There were so many other things we had to do, and now the president just said, blew me off, right? And what he discovered was that Howard Baker said, oh, I'll give you this one, but I'll never give you anything else. And when we got to the end, uh, when the, the assault agreement was going up to the uh, Congress, Howard Baker said to him, I told you, I'd only give you one. <laughs> that was it, you know. Uh, I will say one thing. Uh, um, yeah, anyway, so, uh, so don't Jane, Fonda, Jane Fonda went to Cuba. And when she came back, she went to the UK. And when she came to there, she brought a great big box of cigars to give to her. And uh, great. And Mondale came in every door, every day, and grabbed a whole handful of cigars. And he <laughs> took them, and he took them, and he took them until we only had about three left. And of course, Big never smoked cigars. But he took the box away because he wasn't going to let them have every one of them. <laughs> Later, when I met with the Cubans, they said to me, Well, how did the big like those two boxes of cigars? <laughs> 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 she only left. Les? Yes, hi, Pat. Hi. Um, just for a minute, I think I'm probably the person on this call who knew. Fritz Mondale the least well, because I had my time with him was mainly in conjunction with creating the Department of Education, which fell in my portfolio. And I actually worked with a lot of you on that effort, which turned out to be an incredible team effort. And without um, the vice president, we certainly never would have succeeded. Les and I, and I think Terry Straub was on earlier, I mean, we could tell some great stories about Joe Califano and all the things that went into winning a victory on that legislation by four votes in the House. And then the final conference report, I think, was maybe 14 or 18. I can't remember. But um, just a couple of years ago at a Carter retreat, we talked about the creation of the Department of Education and Fritz was there along with Maxine Isaacs and a, a few of you. And it was just a pleasure for me to be able to spend quality time with him, to have meals with him, to sort of talk about um, not only the Department of Education, but just his dedication to public service. And um, so I, I just want to say that in all the time that I've spent in public service, either in government or in the nonprofit sector or in the private sector, I feel so proud, probably most proud, to have been part of the Carter Mondale administration. I mean, especially with what we've been through for the last four years, but even before that. And now that Joe Biden has shown us that he is going to be a president who's going to fight for the same things that uh, Fritz Mondale valued so much, um, you know, it's exciting again. And I'm so glad that, um, that Fritz lived long enough to know that he won the election. And I think that in a way, Biden is channeling the vice president as he goes on this, I mean, as he pursues a very, very ambitious agenda, um, which we just haven't seen for a long time. Good point. Exactly right. Biden would have enjoyed uh, the speech last week for sure. Absolutely. Uh, 
That's what it reminded me of. That mentions the fight for the Department of Education, and one of the stories I liked from that time was when the, the Fritz told me after it happened, and that was, as we all know, Joe Califano, the Secretary of HEW, had opposed the proposal all the way through from inception uh, all the way through the legislative fight, and, and it's one of the things that led to his uh, ultimate rise in the cabinet. But uh, at one point, Califano sent Hale Champion, the uh, deputy secretary, down to the White House to meet with Mondale to make the Califano case against the Department of Education. And Mondale heard him out and uh, listened carefully. And when Hale finished his pitch, Mondale said to him, well, Hale, you have a problem. And he said, you know, the guy who appointed you to the office you're now in, and he points towards the Oval Office, he said, the guy down there thinks the Department of Education is a pretty good idea. You should, too. Let me, as Les, let me, let me say a word about it. Um, uh, my, like Pat, most of my interactions with the vice president were over the Department of Education bill, spanned a two-year period, one of the toughest fights we had. And um, uh, yeah, I would regularly go into his office with a list of, you know, a dozen or so members of the House that, uh, or the Senate that had to be called. And he had such a great touch. Uh, with members on the Hill because he had, he was of the Hill. And, uh, you know, when you put the list in his hand he, and watched him, he was just a master at the way he would, he would work people. And um, uh, it, it, uh, the politics of that issue were, were, were such that uh, it was the highest, as you all recall, the highest priority of the national, the NEA, the teachers union, it was a war with the AFT that organized most of the, you know, the um, metropolitan areas of the country and the NEA had everything else. But every time uh, we were, you know, our backs were to the wall, I mean, you know, we got that bill out of the Jack Brooks committee by one vote, at one vote margin. And um, we'll never forget one time when the bill was down on the, uh, somebody called it down to the floor. Ben Rosenblatt, I think, came down to the, called it down to the floor. It was one of those all-night sessions about one o'clock in the morning. And uh, the, there were, they had their members there to defeat it. That would have been the end of it. And um, so we called the vice president. The vice president called Tip O'Neill, who was speaker at the time. Remember, it was one o'clock in the morning and prevailed on Tip to come down and go into the well of the house, which as you know, for a speaker is a rare, somewhat rare occasion, and denounce the initiative to take down uh, the president's initiative on the Department of Education, and we prevailed. And that was just one of a number of times that Fritz, you know, knew what to do, knew how to do it, and really saved our ass, frankly, a number of times. The last thing I'll say on this, because you all brought it up about Califano, um, uh, his, um, and I call it treachery, which is really what it was, uh, went beyond uh, just uh, articulating his opposition. I went up, uh, I had a call one time from Frank Thompson. I don't know if you all remember him, Tompy. He was a member from New Jersey's chair of the House Administration Committee. And we go, uh, uh, and he said, could you come up here and see me for a minute? Which I, of course, did. And he handed me a list of a dozen Democrats, members of the House. He said, I want you to take this list, do whatever you want with it. He said, but Califano has personally called all of these people and, and, and lobbied them against this bill, against the president's bill. And uh, I took the list, went downtown, went back to the White House, went over to Hamilton's office, handed it to Hamilton, told him what Tompey had told me. And a week later, Califano was gone. Uh, that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, maybe, I don't know. But, but, um, but my best and most uh, fond, fondest remember, uh, reminiscence of uh, my workings with, with Fritz were over the Department of Education bill and the 
master's touch that he had with members on the Hill. And when he was always there, when you needed him, there was never any time we asked him to do something. He said, Hey, I'm too busy. I can't do it. Get somebody else to do it. He took it on and he did it and did it well. Hey, Terry. Terry, tell, tell them about Jack Brooks. Didn't Jack Brooks, you know, you dealt with a lot. First of all, would you do your Jack Brooks imitation? But uh, Mom Dillon, he got along real well, didn't he? He and uh, he loved Fritz and uh, he would bring Fritz cigars. He would bring him sausage from down in Texas. And uh, the two of them just had a great relationship. And uh, I, I tell you, Brooks was a tough guy, but he was a national Democrat. And he did what he wanted to do was he, he wanted to support his president. He wanted to support his president the most. And uh, uh, Brooks, at the end of the day, was a tough guy. He was a stand-up guy, and he he did more, I think, for Jimmy Carter and for the uh, Carter presidency in the House that people will never know about than oh, yeah. ever I know about. I'll agree completely with that. And one of the guys he loved was Terry Strong. Yeah, he did. Terry, I and Les too. I um, I don't think this ever happens, and I'm not sure how often it happened even in that committee. But I sat with um, Jack Brooks counsel and we wrote that bill. I mean, of course there were a lot of people involved in getting the language just right, but we went through every single issue. I think you were there, weren't you, Terry? I was, and, yeah, and Bill, with Bill Jones. It was Bill Jones, who I, unfortunately is not with us anymore. I was trying to find him recently. Um, but that just doesn't happen anymore. I mean, <laughs> the idea that, and we had the um, Frank Horton's council as well. I mean, it was a bipartisan uh, partnership between uh, the Carter White House and the, and the House Committee. Um, and I think the quality of the legislation benefited tremendously from doing it that way. Jim Free wrote more, more legislation than anybody in Congress. Did you know that? <laughs> he did. He write it up and give it to one of his Southern friends and they introduced it. Well, isn't that the way it's supposed to work? <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. And <laughs> right. Free had it to an art. And you're probably, Much more efficient. Can I tell something about Mondale on the Intelligence Committee? Uh, he was, uh, you know, the, it was the church committee, Frank Church, and uh, it was after Mondale had dropped out of the presidential race uh, in November, October, something, and he started the church committee, and he was, I think, like number two in the church committee, and um, one day, Frank Church comes in, and, and Mondale looks at him and says, I believe the chairman has a presidential haircut. And he had just announced that he was going to run for president. And Church looked at him and says, well, I, I can see you don't have one anymore. And then Mondale <laughs> says, well, in my state, they like shitty haircuts. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to make one point before we end this, and that is when Dick uh, Moe started and we and the point was made, Stu made the point about how Dick was made, not only was he Mondale's chief of staff, but he was assistant to the president. Uh, the, the commentary today really reinforces how closely integrated the staffs were. There was no distinction between the Carter staff, the Mondale staff. I mean, it was an amazing thing that we all worked together. The Gail was in, and Bill Smith were at every one of our uh, morning meetings. Uh, uh, we worked together on congressional stuff, political stuff. Uh, there was absolutely no wall between the two offices or the two staffs. And, and I think this conversation underscores that. And it, it would be interesting to know about subsequent administrations and whether or not the same kind of chemistry uh, existed. But this conversation shows uh, one unique aspect of 
of the administration we served in, and so much of it testifies to Walter Mondale's approach and, and his regard for all of us, how he treated us, and uh, uh, a very special time, I know. For all of us. So, uh, hey, does that, I was, let's, okay. Yes. I just want to say one thing to Natalie when I see her in this corner there. We had no relationship with the National Security Council, if you, those of you who remember that. Uh, Brzezinski was such a soft, nice fellow uh, until Madeline showed up in congressional relations. And then all of a sudden, it all worked. Yeah. Even Brzezinski started listening. That's right. That's right. Well, she was Madeline, you don't have to say anything about that. Sorry. No, but I, I have to say that the kindness of all of you, uh, when in fact I did show up, and uh, it was great to, to work with everybody. Uh, as, but as I said earlier, Brzezinski, I, I have said this, he understood the Soviet system of government better than the American one. And when I would go to, <laughs> have to go up to the hill, David will appreciate this. We'd go up to the hill for something and there never was anybody that was on time. And he said, why am I coming up here to meet with one Senator? when they in fact come down to meet with me in a group. And I said, because they were elected and you were not. Um, and so <laughs> I had a lot of fun kind of uh, telling him about things. And thank God for David, because um, he was in his office right down from his big and I could come out and go, oh, you won't believe what he just said. So, <laughs> right, well, David? Man, yeah. Well, I love Madeline. You were wonderful because we used to play tennis. Yes, Remember? we did do that. Yes, yes, tennis. yeah, yeah. But Miss um, Carter would let us use the tennis. But I do think that the relationship, in terms of um, the NSC staff or other staffs, and all of you in, that were doing congressional relations and working um, with the president and with Mondale, were were just fabulous. A lot of great stories and. Uh, those morning meetings in the Roosevelt Room when I had to keep telling you that Tito was not yet dead. Uh, <laughs> for, for a long, long time. But, um, and I learned a lot. It was great. I learned so much from all of you. And, I and believe it or not, I actually tell some of the stories to my classes now. So, um, you know, and the kinds of, can I tell one story, which is kind of, I kept the book on the SALT Treaty. Uh, and what happened was, it, you know, kind of trying to figure out who was going to vote how. And then there was a reporter, Michael Dobbs, who actually wrote a book about me. Um, and uh, he calls me up at a certain point. We're out of office. I'm Secretary of State and Bill Cohen is Secretary of Defense. And he said, I have to tell you uh, what is going to appear in the Post magazine this weekend about what you wrote in your report to, because I wrote a wrote, I would write a report every week to the president, which I think went through you guys. Um, and I had, he said, and um, you said something about Bill Cohen that you may wish to think about. And I said, well, what did I say about Bill Cohen? And I said, well, he's just a show horse and he's not helpful at all. So there we were in the, um, Clinton administration and every single week we had what was known at that stage as the ABC lunch, Albright, Berger, Cohen. And I had gone and I bought two books on forgiveness, which I'm handing to Bill Cohen. And he said, why are you doing this? And I said, because of what I said about you during the SALT Treaty. And he said, you were absolutely right. I didn't want anything to do with it. So uh, <laughs> the work that we did kind of continued on. But writing that legislative report once a week was, I love doing, and it was just a great way of expressing the importance of the role of Congress in our democracy. So you guys were all great and it was fun to work with you. And thanks for saying that, Bob. Hey, Les. Yeah. It's, it's John Alter, um, who uh, uh, unlike, uh, Pat was wrong. I clearly uh, knew Fritz Mondale much less well than anybody on the call, but I wanted to thank everybody. And I'm also uh, really pleased to see that the recording button is on because 
if I had had this a transcript of this call before I wrote my book, I, I would have had a bunch of new stories. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the book's already been written and published. Volume so, two. Volume so, two. Hey, of, didn't you ban books in this call? <laughs> Nobody yeah. can write a book about these calls. Some some of the uh, some of the stories mentioned in the call uh, on the call, like the one about Hayakawa, are are in the book. But there were so many great ones today, and I just wanted to thank all of you from for on behalf of my fellow historians, because uh, pretty much everything that everybody has said uh, is uh, is of use for uh, for history. So the only Mondale story that I have is a very recent one from 2019 uh, when uh, Jerry Rafshoon and I were at the Carter Center weekend uh, having dinner and and Fritz was having dinner uh, in the same hotel restaurant and we all got together and then uh, watched the first Democratic debate together that night. That was the one where Kamala Harris <laughs> went after Biden. <laughs> and uh, that night, um, uh, Fritz said, um, uh, you know, after Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or one of the other candidates on the left had spoken, he said, you know, I got up one morning recently and I looked in the mirror and I said, Fritz, you're a moderate. <laughs> and, you know, so uh, he clearly uh, he clearly favored Joe Biden and uh, was happy with the result. So, yeah. did we hear from Bernie Aronson? Well, sure. I'll tell you one story about being a speechwriter for Mondale. So he had his own process and. We'd set up an event three, four weeks out, and and I would go see him to talk about what should be in the speech. And uh, he would say, you know, just do me a draft. So I'd go back to my office and I'd spend a week pounding out a bunch of ideas, trying to come up with a draft. I'd go see him again after sending the draft in. And he'd sit there and uh, he had a cigar in his hand, unlit, and he'd leaf through the through the speech that I had written and he just sort of glanced at it and he put it down. He said, you know, that's not really what I want to say, Bernie. This is what I want to say. And then he'd go through a, an eloquent, well-organized sort of idea with some language I could use. And this went on week after week, and, uh, month after month. And, and finally about six months in, I, I sat down with him in one of these sessions and I said, you know, Mr. Vice President, to go through this process where you, I ask you what you want to say and you don't tell me, you tell me to write a draft, I do. And then you tell me you don't want to use the draft. You want to, you think we could leave out the part where I have to write a draft that you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he leans back and he said, you don't understand, Bernie. Um, your job as a speechwriter is to suffer. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> and I said, well, Mr. Vice President, I think it's working. <laughs> and the other funny thing about him, and Gail will appreciate this because she remembers, is that he was more interested in having a joke at the start of a speech to kind of warm up the audience and get relaxed than he cared about the substance, unless it was a foreign policy and national security uh, speech. So the first speech I wrote him, he said, you know, try to come up with a joke. And I came up with this joke, which I I could tell real quickly if there's time, but, um, and it, well, if you guys remember after Carter was nominated, he had six different candidates for vice president come down to Plains one by one to see him and to talk with Rosalind and make his decision. So the, so the joke went, we call it the peanut tree joke. So the joke went this way. Mondo says, I, I want to tell you what my strategy was for getting to be the, the running mate. So I let all my competitors go first. So John Glenn flew down the plains and he sidled up to Rosalind and he said, you know, I'm really looking forward to trying your blue eyed peas. And then uh, um, uh, 
Frank Church came down and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the peanut trees. And then finally, uh, Ed Muskie came down and said, you know, I had a relative who, who visited Georgia, you know, decades ago, General Sherman. And then Mondo says, uh, Mondo says he, when he arrived in planes, you know, Carter walked up to him and said, if you keep your mouth shut, the job is yours. Uh. <laughs> so it was a peanut tree joke. And, and he kept using the peanut tree joke for weeks and months. Eventually, it kind of wore out. And then he would start to write me memo saying, where's the next joke? And I realized that I had made a mistake of historic proportions in my career because he thought I could just turn out a joke like that, you know, anytime, you know, he was going to speak. And it's hard to write political humor. So I never actually wrote a joke as good as the peanut tree joke, but he, he expected I would do so every time. And just on a personal note, you know, all of us have been around a lot of politicians, but Mondale lived his values in a way that not all politicians do. And if you, I would say there's two things about this conversation that come through. One is the great loyalty we all feel towards him as a, as a boss and a public servant, as a human being, how proud we are to work with him. And the other is all the love that people feel for the guy that he was a prince of a man and a good boss and a decent guy. And uh, I had the privilege of working with him a few months ago, actually, in the in the midterms. We, we put together a fundraiser for a candidate in Minnesota named Dan Fien, who was running in the first district. And, and I asked, I sent him a, a note asking if he would appear as a Zoom event, and he did. And once the word got out that Mondo was going to be on the, the, the uh, fundraiser, Nancy Pelosi signed up and Steny Warrior and Dennis McDonough and just the catalog of Democratic stars, Madeline came and uh, it was great. And everybody just, you know, expressed how much affection they had for Mondale. And, and it's, it's just amazing at 92, he was still willing to get out there in the arena and, and try to help a Democrat get elected. So uh, he was, a, he was a, a rare unicorn for all of us, I think, and a great, Servant of this country. Well, okay. I well, remember sir. one thing about about Fritz, and that was that he didn't read a speech very well. And I recall that Marty, and I think I think went during his presidential election uh, campaign, rather, uh, he uh, decided that he was gonna we're gonna take everything he ever said, uh, you know, just uh, uh, off the cuff. And we were going to put it into a speech. And Marty, I think, pulled all this stuff together. And he got a speech that was entirely made of things that he had already said. And then he went to this, give the speech. And he read it like the phone book. <laughs> he was. You remember that, Marty? I, I don't know what you would call it. Or not. it. It didn't help, you know. He could speak <laughs> off the cuff, but he had a hard time. He also had a hard time on uh, uh, being good in front of television because he was so hot. You know, he learned how to his how to do speaking in in barns with Hubert Humphrey. He burned the paint off the back of the wall. He tried to explain to him that TV is a cool medium. He never got that. I'm glad he did. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, Bertie told a great story about his initiation. And I know the hour is late, but just a quick one. My, the first speech I wrote for him, uh, it was for a labor convention, I think. And um, he uh, called me into his office and I sat there while he read it. And then he looked up, he pointed to the speech and he said, these, these are just words. <laughs> 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 and, and I didn't know how to get around that in my job. I would like to ask the group if anybody knows the whereabouts of Bill Smith. Do you remember Bill Smith, who was in effect the chief of staff to the president of the Senate? Yeah. Concierge yeah. of the Senate lobby <laughs> yes he was he was the best and and, yes. and and 
And I wrote a long memo or a memo to, to Les and Frank Moore and Bob Russell about him, and but I lost track of him the day after we left office. He was the best, but he was on Mondale's staff, but he worked in the Senate. Do you know what happened to him, Mike Berman? No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I lost track of him several years ago. Gail, how about you? The, the last I heard, which was a long time ago, was he was doing something totally different, like- Yes, oh, absolutely, gone. Treasure hunting in Florida, off the yes. coast of Florida. I think that's right, anyhow. He'd been, I tried to track him down too, and without any luck, and because <laughs> he, he again was a regular member of our team at every one of our meetings, and and uh, so active on the hill. Uh, oh, he was he was the best. Hey Tate, you when you two walked together, though, I do remember Bill with lumber a little bit like you did, and you got behind you, and you a pile of people trying to get around you too. <laughs> but you were very very quiet and uh, slow and real slow uh <laughs> walking i mean and bill was like that he just go it but he was very effective when he got into it i'll tell you that well many of you people who were came from the vice president's staff would have been proud of the man he was he did so much for the carter mondale administration and he but, sure did thank you uh, I thank you all for taking time. This has been great. Uh, and Jay, I, I will figure out, I've recorded this. Uh, uh, Jonathan, your point about uh, having this recorded for historians, I may want to go back and edit some of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Of course you can, but, you know, it's just nice to have it unvarnished and uh, it's so sincere and and at least half the stories are true. So yeah, <laughs> it's up to you guys to figure out which half. Right? Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Les. Lots of fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.